APCO Basic Science Video Topic Sexually Transmitted Infections Sexually transmitted infections are infections passed from one person to another through intimate physical contact. The CDC estimates that nearly 20 million new sexually transmitted infections occur every year. They are a major public health problem and account for almost $16 billion in health care costs annually. Many cases go undiagnosed, resulting in lifelong health outcomes such as chronic pain and reproductive health complications. The objectives of this video are to understand the pathophysiology of common STIs, describe the long-term sequelae of STIs, and understand the mechanism of action for treatment of common STIs. To review the clinical aspects and management of STIs, please see the APCO Educational Topic Number 36 on Sexually Transmitted Infections and Urinary Tract Infections. In addition, to review human papillomavirus, please see the APCO Basic Science video on CIN. Let's meet our patient. She is a 22-year-old nulla gravida who presents to clinic for increased vaginal discharge. She is sexually active with men and uses birth control pills for contraception, but does not use condoms. She has been sexually active with a new partner in the last month. During her exam, you collect several swabs and perform wet mount microscopy. She asks you, what are you testing for? You review with her some common STIs that are being tested. Chlamydia is the most common bacterial cause of STIs. Chlamydia is caused by the bacteria Chlamydia trachomatis. It is an obligate intracellular organism. This means that chlamydia relies on a host cell and its resources. Chlamydia exists in two forms, as extracellular infectious elementary bodies and intracellular non-infectious reticulate bodies. How does infection occur? Elementary bodies attach and invade vaginal epithelial cells through cell surface receptors. Elementary bodies reorganize into a reticulate body inside a phagosome. The reticulate bodies replicate via binary fission and forms an inclusion. The inclusion condenses into elementary bodies. Cell lysis then releases elementary bodies that go on to infect other cells. Another common STI is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, a gram-negative diplococci. Like chlamydia, they are an obligate intracellular bacterium. Let's pause, read, and apply. How does Neisseria gonorrhea attach to host cells? They have pili, which are long, hair-like projections. Pili allow the bacteria to adhere to mucosal membranes. After attaching, the bacteria invades the host cell and is able to multiply and divide intracellularly. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are typically diagnosed with nucleic acid amplification testing, or NAAT, given its superior sensitivity and specificity to other tests, and can be collected from a cervical swab or from urine. This method amplifies bacterial DNA or RNA sequences. The wet mount you obtain screens for trichomonas. It is caused by trichomonas vaginalis and is an anaerobic flagellated protozoan. It is pear or round shaped with four anterior flagellae. On wet mount, trichomonas moves with a jerky and spinning motion. Pathogenesis is not well understood, but the protozoan primarily infects the squamous epithelium of the urogenital tract. Besides wet mount, trichomonas can also be diagnosed with NAAT, DNA hybridization probes, and rapid antigen tests. She would like to know more about herpes. You discuss with her that it can be asymptomatic, but can also present as an outbreak of tender lesions. You review that herpes is caused by the herpes simplex virus. Primary infection occurs with viral entry into the sensory nerves. There is retrograde axonal transport to the dorsal root ganglion and the virus develops lifelong latency. HSV can be reactivated with viral particles and proteins transported anterograde into the skin and mucous membranes and viral shedding occurs. As the virus infects cells, cell lysis occurs resulting in lesions that appear as multiple vesicles and shallow ulcers. There are two types of HSV. HSV1 is typically associated with oral infections and HSV2 is more often found with genital infections but it's important to remember that both types can cause genital herpes. Diagnosis is typically confirmed with viral culture or PCR of active lesions. You recommend that she also get testing for syphilis. The number of cases of syphilis has increased every year since 2001. Syphilis is caused by treponema pallidum, a gram-negative spirochete. Infection occurs with direct contact with infectious lesions during sex. The outer membrane of the bacteria promotes attachment to mucous membranes, leading to a primary syphilis lesion at that site, which manifests as a painless chancre, an ulcerated lesion with an indurated margin. 
Spirochetes travel via the lymphatic system to regional lymph nodes, causing disseminated disease consistent with secondary syphilis, occurring weeks to a few months after the chancre develops. Symptoms of secondary syphilis include constitutional symptoms such as fever, malaise, and myalgias. Symptoms of both primary and secondary syphilis self-resolve. If untreated, 25-40% to 40 of patients will develop late disease or tertiary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis can occur any time from 1-30 to 30 years after primary infection. Tertiary syphilis can infect many organs, including aortitis and cardiovascular syphilis, gomatous syphilis, which are granulomatous nodular lesions that can occur in the skin, bones, and internal organs, and CNS involvement, also known as neurosyphilis. Methods that detect the organism directly from a lesion, such as with dark field microscopy, are not readily available. Diagnosis is typically with serology, including non-treponemal tests such as RPR and VDRL. If these tests are reactive, confirmatory testing with treponemal tests such as fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption tests are performed. She agrees to RPR screening. Our patient's test results come back. Her chlamydia test is positive and everything else is negative. You discuss treatment is with a single dose of one gram of azithromycin and is considered curative. What is the mechanism of action? Azithromycin binds to the 50S subunit of the bacterial ribosome. Remember that ribosomes serve as the site of protein synthesis. Ribosomes have both the 50S and the 30S subunit. They bind to messenger RNA and use its sequence to determine the correct sequence of amino acids, seen here in pink. Amino acids are linked together into peptide chains and then fold into the correct protein structure. Azithromycin binds to the 50S subunit which arrests RNA-dependent bacterial protein synthesis, inhibiting bacterial growth. You discuss the importance of treating her partner, as well as the importance that she also receives treatment herself. An untreated infection can ascend through the cervix and allows bacteria to enter the uterus and then to the fallopian tubes. This results in pelvic inflammatory disease. Bacteria causes destruction of the epithelial cells and cilia, causing a localized inflammatory reaction. Chronic inflammation then results in tissue remodeling and scarring. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are the most commonly isolated pathogens of PID, although it can be caused by many other infections. It is important to note that cervical swabs may be negative since the bacteria ascends in PID. Let's pause, read, and apply. What long-term sequelae can occur secondary to PID? PID can cause infertility in 10 to 20%, ectopic pregnancy in 6 to 10 percent, and chronic pelvic pain in 15 to 20 percent of PID patients. 25 percent of PID patients will have at least one of these sequelae. Let's review treatment for the other STIs we have discussed. Gonorrhea is treated with a 250 milligram intramuscular dose of ceftriaxone. Dual therapy with one gram of azithromycin is also recommended given an increase in gonococcal resistance to cephalosporin antibiotics. Ceftriaxone binds to transpeptidases. Seen in this image is a bacteria cell, labeled with the cytoplasm, plasma membrane, and peptidoglycan cell wall. Transpeptidases are an enzyme within the bacterial cell wall, which helps cross-link peptidoglycan polymers. Ceftriaxone decreases bacterial cell wall synthesis. Damage to the bacterial cell wall then causes cell lysis. Treatment for syphilis is with benzathine penicillin G given intramuscularly. The mechanism of action for penicillin is similar to ceftriaxone, with inactivation of transpeptidases leading to impaired bacterial wall synthesis. Treatment for trichomonas is with a single dose of 2 grams of metronidazole. Metronidazole diffuses across the cell membrane of trichomonas. After being taken in, an enzyme of the trichomonas reduces the nitro group of metronidazole. This means it gains electrons. This promotes production of free radicals, causing damage to bacterial DNA, ultimately causing cell death. Lastly, treatment for HSV is with nucleoside analogs such as acyclovir. It is not curative, but can decrease frequency and severity of outbreaks. Acyclovir is converted to acyclovir triphosphate, which competitively inhibits and inactivates HSV DNA polymerases. Look at the similarity between guanosine triphosphate and acyclovir triphosphate. The difference is between a hydroxyl group shown here. This is where the next DNA base is added. The lack of a hydroxyl group on acyclovir results in chain termination since there is no place for another base to attach. This prevents further viral DNA synthesis. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on sexually transmitted infections. 
We have covered a lot, including the pathophysiology and treatment of common STIs, as well as some long-term sequelae from STIs. Thank you.